Judas Iscariot. There's a loose end that we need to tie off. And a couple of you chatted with me yesterday about his repentance. It's troubled me, it's bothered me, I've itched at it, scratched at it for years. I think I have the beginning of an answer that is a non-authoritative answer, but it's, it's the beginning of an answer that might be added by you to what you're already thinking through as you look at this altogether complex and enigmatic man, Judas Iscariot. So come with me to Matthew chapter 26. Johnny did refer to this passage, but we'll look at it again. Remember, this is the time in the upper room, verse 22. They were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it me? That, that, that means every last one of them had considered abandoning Christ. Every one of them. Every one of them had considered walking away from him. Every one of them. That's why they all asked the question. You know, Judas uses a different word. We talked about that in one way yesterday. Johnny referred to it in a different way today. And that's great, because now you've got an enrichment for different ways of interpreting what that might have meant. But notice what the Lord Jesus Christ says. Verse 23. He answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. And you just, you just think. Think of what a terrible thing it is the Lord Jesus Christ has just said. Remember, if you could just go back quickly to Psalm 109, very, very briefly, just to look at a few words, simple words, nothing, nothing earth-shattering and deep and difficult to understand. Very, very simple words. Psalm 109, verse 7. When he shall be judged... Let him, and the revised version says, come forth guilty. That's Judas Iscariot on the day of judgment. That's what Judas has to look forward to. It would have been good, better for Judas Iscariot if he had never, ever been born. And the rest of the, the, rest of the picture in Psalm 109 indicates nothing in the way of true remorse in the heart of the man or the individuals who are wounding and who are showing cruelty to this man who is poor. And of course we know this psalm is quoted in connection with Judas Iscariot and his bishopric, which another was to take on. And yet when we go to Matthew chapter 27, this is what we read. Matthew 27. And there it says, verse 3, Then Judas, which, he, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. They said, well, what's that to us? That's your problem. He cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And hanged himself. But the great struggle we have is over whether or not this means there was some kind of Remorse. He, we struggle, we wrestle with whether he felt badly for what he had done to the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes people look at those words, he repented himself, and they interpret out of that that it was more about himself. Well, well yes, that's what's happening, but that's not what that word means. The word repented 
is a Greek word which just means he regretted doing it. He realized he had made a big mistake. But it didn't change his mindset. It didn't change his attitude. It did not touch his character. And the wounding of Jesus, the hardship that Jesus went through because of him, is not what touched him. That's not what touched him. Not one bit. What touched him is something that he remembered that destroyed all his plans. What did he remember? When, when he says, I betrayed the innocent blood, is he saying, I hurt my friend, an innocent man. I can't believe what I did to him. That's not what he's saying. When he says that, he's quoting something. And he's quoting something that you will find in Deuteronomy chapter 27. Deuteronomy 27. We're going to look at verse 25. And I really feel for you, brothers and sisters, of this, <laughs> this last session. Because you are saturated. Anything that you take in in this class will be like dropping water on a stove. It'll wet the outside, but I don't know how much it'll sink in. <laughs> and that's not... Your limitation, it's just the limitation of all this information that's come at you through the course of this week. Right? But verse 25, look what it says. And this is, this is the great back and forth of the cursings and the blessings between the two mountains. And in verse 25 it says, Cursed that is cursed by the law. Cursed by God. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person. And all the people shall say Amen. And Judas is the primary fulfiller of those words. What Judas realized and what made him kill himself was that he was a man with nowhere to go. He was condemned by the law of Moses because of what he had done. And he realized it in full force. And he had walked away from the Messiah and betrayed him. So he had neither law nor grace on his side. He had nothing. And he had no money. And there was no life that he could live. And there was no prosperity that he could construct for himself and his family. And he realized the position he was in. And Ahithophel like ended it all. That's why he killed himself. The remorse that he had was not remorse that changed him. Remember 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. That was Peter's repentance. That was his sorrow. Salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. So this was a man, in spite of all of his strategy, all of his tactical plans, all of his theft, all of his manipulation of people and circumstances, all of his grandiose ideas of his importance and the importance that he would have in the kingdom he imagined, in spite of all of that, found himself pinned so tight in a crevice that the only way out was to kill himself. That that was the regret he had. Not for what he did to Christ, but for what he did to himself. Because of what he did to Christ. That was the quality of his remorse. And so brothers and sisters, rightly, you know, as Johnny reminded us, 
as we spoke in terms of yesterday. At the end of the life of Judas, the question we need to ask ourselves is not why did he do what he did? It's not what kind of man was Judas. The question we need to ask ourselves is what of Judas is in me? What of the betrayer is in me? Is it I, Lord? That's the lesson. So now we shift. Now we shift to a woman. We left her to last because, well, there's so much that is special about her. There, there was more than one Mary, including the, the mother of the Lord. And this Mary, this Mary's last name was not Magdalene. She was Mary of Magdala. Mary of Magdala. And we sometimes think to ourselves, that's to differentiate her from the others by noting where she came from. Maybe that's not so. Maybe she was called Mary of Magdala because everybody knew her as the mad woman of Magdala. That little fishing village on the shore of the, the Sea of Galilee, northwest, in the general region of the area of the town, close to Capernaum, which was a kind of base of operations for the Lord and his disciples. The area where Peter lived. Everybody knew Mary of Magdala. Everybody knew her. Mark chapter 16, brothers and sisters, just for a brief moment, and then we'll come back later for some more sustained focus. Mark chapter 16, <laughs> verse 9. And when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. She was a demoniac. She was mentally ill. Seven. This is a woman who was completely and fully and profoundly mentally ill. Now there are all kinds of legends about the life of Mary, but they're, they're mostly unsupportable. And yet, if we could just imagine our way into what the life of a woman who was so seriously mentally ill that she was completely and utterly divorced from reality, what would that life be like for her? If we talked to her, what would she say to us? Might she not say things like, I was completely on my own, day and night. I was the bottom of society. I was the least of the least of the town of Magdala. I'd wake up in the morning and I would feel like there was a column of darkness on my shoulders. And I would wonder every morning why I was still alive. Why didn't God take my life last night? I had a husband once. He couldn't take what I was. And I don't blame him. I took my dowry money. And I hid it. I hid it where no one could find it. Even in the state of mind that I was in. People in the street would walk by me and I would see the disgust on their faces. I would see the horror. I would hear the mother say, you keep behaving like that, you'd be like Crazy Mary. Is that what you want to be like? You'll be like Crazy Mary. You want to be Mary of Magdala? Behave. 
That's why I beat you so you don't become like her. The children would throw things at me and spit on me in the street. Sometimes bad people would find me at night time. And no one would defend me. And crying out wouldn't have done anything. So I just put up with whatever happened to me. I was nobody's wife, nobody's child. I had a couple of relatives that showed me kindness, but I'd have to go to the back door. And I'd have to promise to be quiet. And I would hold myself back so I didn't rave and rage. I was beaten regularly in the streets because I would see some of these bad people and I would start to scream and to shout about the kind of people they really are and what they try to pretend to be in daylight. And they would beat me in the street. Nobody would do anything. From early morning, the voices would be going in my mind, in my head. I couldn't stop the voices. They told me bad things about me, bad things about what I'd done. They told me to do terrible things. And sometimes I did do those things. Sometimes I believed I was a queen, and sometimes I believed I was a harlot. But always I knew, deep down in my heart, something is terribly wrong with me. Every once in a while, I'd creep into the edge of the neighborhood just so I could catch a glimpse of my child. My child that another woman was raising. And I would go and I would cry by myself and wish that God would take my life. I would rage in the streets. I would throw dust upon myself. I would tear my clothing. And any beauty that I had wasn't a blessing to me. It was a curse. And then one day, there was a crowd going by. And a man walked right up to me. He stood quietly. And the rage welled up in me. The fight welled up in me. And I wanted to scream, and I wanted to shout, and I wanted to protest. And I wanted him to get away from me. And he said, Mary, be clean. Come out of her. And suddenly I could see clearly. In the darkness, the darkness was gone. And I looked at my hands. And I wondered, whose hands are these? How could they have gotten like this? Why am I so dirty? What is this? What is this? This smell? I'm filthy. That man looked at me with kindness I had never seen in my entire life. Gentleness. He was calm and tender. And when he looked at me, he didn't look at me the way men looked at me. looked at me like I was his sister, like I was his family. And that moment changed my life. 
And I realized I'll never be a respectable woman because I'm Mary Magdala. Crazy Mary. I'll never be someone who will have a family because who would marry me? But I'm going to give my life to him. But I had to be careful. I knew what people would say if I spent too much time with him. I knew what people would say about him. And I didn't care what they said about me. I had no reputation to defend. I was crazy Mary. But I wouldn't let them say anything about him. And he, he was my father, my brother, my mother, my sister. I was willing to do anything for him, anything at all. And his mom was so kind to me. I was so used to the cursing and the insults and the injury of the women that walked by me in the street, even the old women. She treated me with love and respect. And she encouraged me to, to do things. She saw I could. I could do things, I could organize things, I could, I could get the women to come and do something with me. She made me feel like I was a person. You know, brothers and sisters, mental illness is not people behaving badly because they don't read their Bibles enough, or because they don't attend all the meetings. Mental illness is something that exists. I mean, the very text of the New Testament would apply that to us. When we read that the Lord Jesus Christ cast something out of legion that went into the pigs, it's not because mental illness was a figment of the imagination. It's because there was something in him that made him ill, that made him sick that he took out of him. The National Institute for Mental Health, NIM, American organization, has assessed and determined one in five Americans is affected by mental illness. There are others today that feel that the ratio is as high as one in three. And they acknowledge that there is not any one explanation, in fact, they had difficulty coming up with precise explanations for why this is taking place. Some see the genetic flaw, the genetic tendency going from generation down and then just spreading mathematically as would be logically mathematical. But others feel the pace of life and the stresses of the age in which we live are also having an effect on us that is increasing the incidence of mental illness. In its extreme cases, what is mental is illness like? It's like human nature unbound, with no controls whatsoever. And yet, in Israel, it was the mentally ill who were the first to see, apart from people like John the Baptist, who Jesus was. Because there were parts of their brain that were operating, that had the ability to precisely, insightfully identify who he was, when all the same people couldn't. There's people like crazy Mary, who knew that he was the Son of God. We know who you are. The high priests didn't know who he was. The scribes and the Pharisees and Pilate, the governor, didn't know who he was. But they knew. They knew. The kinds of mental illness that afflict those we love might include things like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder, and just clinical depression on its own, which when it is serious enough to drive an individual to feel they have no other recourse but to take their own lives. 
Now, can't play junior analyst and junior psychiatrist and junior psychologist, but what we are, what we are in Ecclesiastes is part of a tremendously powerful support network. And what our brothers and sisters who struggle with mental illness need for us to do more than anything else is not try to fix them up or to say, I know exactly what you've got. Or to try and find ways to resolve the problems in their lives. Some of these things can't be resolved. And some of these things are so multifaceted in their complexity. It's not just the illness. It's all of the mess of their lives. All the breakdown. All the addictions with which, with which they have tried to self-medicate and, and hold themselves together. And all the bad decisions and things that they've been involved in. All the altogether messes of the hand of the God of the fallen must act in in order to help them to get through. What they need from us is love, <coughs> understanding, and a whole lot of listening. Not the talk, 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 talk that we're prone to, but deep listening. To understand how bad is this? Can I get some help? Can I connect this brother or this sister with somebody that can give them help? And yes, there's help that we can get from the outside. People that are trained. Now, now, now if you are afraid that somehow a psychotherapist is going to tell your brother or sister to leave the truth, the chances are that's not the case. Because they're trained to understand we need to look at all of the social supports that they have in their lives from which they can draw some strength that can help them as they deal with their illness. But I'll ask you a question that you want to reflect on. If your ecclesia is a harsh, judgmental, edgy, self-righteous, negative, critical place where people feel they can never be themselves and where people always have to be on their guard watching themselves because they'll get the hammer blow of brothers and sisters around them. If that's your ecclesia, even to a degree, might a therapist not conclude it's a bad place? Would they be wrong? Our ecclesias have got to be loving, nurturing, supportive environments. Where people who struggle with these illnesses, and more and more of them will, more and more of them will, more and more of us will, where people like that feel, I still have a place. I'm not crazy Mary on the bottom of society. I'm among brothers and sisters who love me. And they encourage me. And they make me feel like I'm important. Not like I'm nobody. And so we should never ever tell a brother or a sister the reason you have depression is because dot, 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 dot. We have not the right to do that. We've got the right to say, I don't know what it's like. But I can tell you I'm at your side. And I love you. And if you need me to come and pick you up and bring you to the meeting, I'm coming. If you need me to help you and go take you to get groceries, I'm going to do that. If you need me to help pick up the kids at school or take them from home so I can give you a day by yourself and I can look after them, I'm going to do that. If you need somebody to talk to and you are on the edge, I will listen. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. And so brothers and sisters, crazy Mary comes into the truth. Which is Mary of Magdala. Now Magdala means the tower, the watchtower, tower, something lofty, something that has inbuilt strength 
And that is a means of seeing what's going on down below, all around the tower. And it's got that kind of perspective that it provides to the person in it. It sees needs, and it meets the needs. It sees danger coming, and the person in the tower reacts. But you know, when we see Mary, she's amongst the women, working, laboring, building, strengthening. We learn about her that she was one of the women out of whose purse the needs of the Lord were met. So Judas Iscariot would have sussed out everybody that had money, even a little bit of money. Perhaps, perhaps Mary, now well and in her right mind, had her dowry and used it, used it, sold what she could to make money to help with the food arrangements, to help with the travel arrangements, to help with accommodations when they had to pay for accommodations. And maybe at the end, to buy spices to prepare his body. Sometimes in the stupid novels that have been written, there's all kinds of nonsense that is interpreted into the relationship between Mary Magdalene and the Lord Jesus Christ. But what we have is a woman utterly and completely grateful for what she received. That's, that's what she is. Now when we go, brothers and sisters, to John, Chapter 19. I read the following words. Verse 25. Now they stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary of Magdala. Now we read that, we just went on. And we see it in a movie or in a television show and we just carry on. But stop and think what that meant. If you were his mother, people might understand that. Just as they cast in your teeth the things that you were and that he was for him to be up on that cross. But for you to be a woman not related to him or his family, to be standing at the feet of someone that was condemned by the priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Romans. That was to be in an altogether shameful situation. This was a man covered in shame, whose shame now enveloped you. What would people say about you in the neighborhood you lived in? How would people view you? That's crazy, Mary. She followed that man and was crucified. The liar, the deceiver. But that's the kind of woman she was anyway. She's a low-life refuse kind of individual. Mary knew all that, but she didn't care. Because Mary's love and respect and gratitude towards Christ exceeded any fear she had for what people would think about her. What can anyone do to me? Mary of Magdala, that hasn't already been done to me. Am I not going to be with that woman and at my Lord's feet? And so here she is, clothed and in her right mind at her master's feet, with her arm around his mother, steadying Mary as best she could, and looking up at him and trying to hold herself together as best she could. For him, 
and for Mary. And then, brothers and sisters, we go to chapter 20. And it says, The first day of the week cometh Mary of Magdala early. Now, the Synoptic Gospels, the other Gospel records, talk about a group of women coming together. But John, John's Gospel selects out and focuses on Mary Magdalene. Why would he do that? Why would God move him to do that? She was the least of these, my brethren. Now, Crazy Mary wasn't just Crazy Mary to the people outside. She was Crazy Mary to the people who knew her, some of whom were followers of Jesus. And the stigma of mental illness, which still exists today, would follow her, would still be with her, even amongst the disciples. And when Christ is risen, he shows himself to crazy Mary, the least of all the disciples. And it says, While it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and see the stone taken away from the sepulcher. She runs, therefore, and finds Simon and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and says to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre. And we know not where they have laid him. And so she's desperate. She's desperate because she wants to do this last act of respect and love. And take his body, they hadn't completed the preparations, and prepare. She didn't mind if he stank. She didn't mind if there was water decay. She didn't mind. She knew what stink was. She'd had it on her own per person when she was crazy Mary in the streets of Magdala with everything wrong with her. She didn't mind that. But he's gone. He's not in the tomb. And then Simon, Peter, John run the foot race. John gets to the, to the, to the mouth, cat overcome his Jewish scruples in connection with death and decay, Peter darts past him, goes into the tomb, and then finds that he's not there. The cloth from his head, well, it's, it's folded up. It's in one place. And, and, then, and, and for those of you that are women, look at these typical two men in this situation, and you can have a good laugh when you think about it, right? It, it, it says, For as yet, verse 9, they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again unto their own home. And who do they leave? Crazy Mary crying at the tomb by herself. Now, now isn't that like a man to maybe not pay attention to what was going on? And to be so focused in his mind that he had to do something or be someplace and just leave her there. So there she is, left alone, crazy Mary, bottom of the ecclesia. The mad woman who has changed. The woman everybody looked down on in the streets of Magdala, now a believer following Christ and in her right mind, but, but abandoned again, and she knew what it felt like because she'd felt that feeling before. And there she is, it says. She stood outside the sepulchre weeping. But as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And what was she looking at? <laughs> She's looking at a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. There's two angels. These two creatures 
They represent what we are going to be like when we are perfected. But they're on either end. And it's just like the mercy seat. And there are the angels. And they're looking at, their, at her and they tell her what they tell her. But she's, all, she's almost had a vision of what we're all going to be like in God's kingdom. Crazy Mary sees the fulfillment of the dream and the vision and the hope of the character. But then it says, they say unto her, Woman, why are you crying? And she says unto them, Because they're taking away my Lord. Now she had said to Peter, back in verse 2, they've taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre. But now she's speaking about what he meant to her. My Lord, they've taken him away. This man that I love with everything in me, my father, my brother, my only family. Taken him away. And then they say unto her, she says unto them, and I don't know where they've laid him. And when she had said this, she turned herself back, and she saw Jesus standing, and she didn't know it was Jesus. Now, why didn't she know it was Jesus? It was early morning, it's still dark. That's a possibility. Just crying, so her eyes are filled with tears running over. But also it may just have been that at this moment Jesus is preventing her from seeing who he is. And then Jesus says to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Now he doesn't say, what are you looking for? That's what he said to the disciples back in chapter 1 that were following him. Now he's walking along. John the Baptist has said, Behold the Lamb of God. And then he says it again. And then they go following after him. And he turns and he says to them, Not, what's wrong with you two? He doesn't say, What do you want? He says, What are you looking for? Now we're going to use a big word. That is the great existential question that we are all asked. What are we looking for? What are we looking for? Is it the kingdom or luxury on the earth? Is it the hope of eternal life? Or is it the enjoyment of the pleasures of now? But when he says what he says to her, he doesn't say what? Because she's not looking for a corpse. That's what she thinks she's looking for. He doesn't use what? He uses who? Because he's not a corpse. He's a living being, standing upright in front of her, full of life. Full of life. And she's supposing him to be the God, and said unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. Now that, that word, sir, gives you an insight into Mary's placement in society. She calls the gardener this respectful term. Showing deference and respectfulness to him. Because that's what she was used to doing. And then she says, if you've take, taken him away, tell me where you have laid him. And I will take him away. Do you know what she was prepared to do? Mary was prepared to lift the corpse of Jesus in her own arms and take him away. And take him away. That's what she was prepared to do. Now that, for any Jew, would have been utterly repugnant because decay would have occurred by this point in time, or started. But there's no corpse to carry. And then it says, Jesus said to her, 
Mary. And she recognizes his voice. And she turns herself and she says to him, in Hebrew, Ramuni, which is my teacher, my teacher. Now where, where had we seen that before? You saw it when blind Bartimaeus crying out for the son of David to heal him. As the son of God say, bring him to me. And they bring him after telling him, shut your mouth. You nobody, shut up. An important man is going through, just be quiet. And he comes to him, he says, what would you have me do? He says, Rabboni, that I might see. And he heals him so that he can see. And she couldn't see who he was either. And he opens up her eyes so that she, who like Bartimaeus, the son of the polluted, might be the first that he revealed himself to. And she cries out and she grabs him and Jesus says, don't hang on to me, don't handle me, don't keep clinging on to me. For I'm not yet ascended to my Father. So Christ, he was raised he was raised mortal. He hadn't yet ascended to his Father. And that change to immortality, that was going to come, but not just at this particular moment in time. And he can't be detained. And she's grabbing on and holding on to him. And it says, in verse 17, Go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. What did he do to little Mary of Magdala, crazy Mary? He made her, on resurrection morning, the apostle to the apostles, carrying the news of the resurrection. And he sends her with this message of resurrection to them. And they don't believe it. Because she's crazy Mary. She's crazy Mary. How do we know that? Mark chapter 16, verse 9. Now when Jesus was risen the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. First, not to Peter, not to John, not to James, not to Andrew, to none of them, but to little Mary Magdalene, bottom of the ecclesia. That's who he appears to. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, what's the word that is used? Revised version? Disbelieved. Disbelieved. Verse 13. Others went and told it unto the residue. Neither believed they them. Verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and he upbraided them. He cast it in their teeth. It's the same word used of the thieves on the cross, casting it in his teeth. That's the same word. So it's harsh, tough, strong rebuke. And so I would suggest that perhaps you did the wrong thing, perhaps by maybe not fully believing what this woman said to you. That's the way a Canadian would say it, not wanting to offend anyone. She's, he says it straight to them. As harshly as the word upbraided is, 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 is indicating in the Greek. Now why? Why is that? Look at and count the number of times belief and unbelief occur in this particular section. The words in totality together show up at least six times in these very few verses, verse 11, all the way down to verse 17. So he upbraided them with their unbelief, their hardness of heart, because they believed not 
them which had seen him after he was risen so seven times. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he that disbelieves shall be condemned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they do what? Cast out devils. You laughed at crazy Mary, did you? You thought she didn't know what she was talking about? You're going to be healing people like Mary. I sent her to you to teach you a lesson. You know what the lesson is? When you go out there preaching the resurrection, people will think you're crazy. You experience what you put Mary through. You acted as if she wasn't telling the truth. You acted as if, as, as if she was crazy. You acted as if I had not healed her. You will heal people like her as you go out there preaching the truth and being seen by them as crazy. As crazy. Now look. John chapter... Sorry, Mark chapter 3, verse 21. I'll just read these verses to you. And when his friends heard of it, they went down to lay hold on him. For they said, he is beside himself. That means literally, he's out of his mind. He's out of his mind. And then it says, in John chapter 10, verses 19 to 21, there arose a division therefore again among the Jews because of these words. And many of them said, he hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, these are not the sayings of one possessed with a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Well, that's not all. There'd be a young girl named Rhoda, and she would see Peter at the gate, and you would ask yourself, why didn't this child open the gate? But she ran back in the house and said, Peter's at the gate. And, uh, and what does it say, they said? They said unto her, Acts 15, verse 15, Thou art mad! But she confidently affirmed that it was even so. So here Peter has this, this in-type resurrection, and she confidently affirms it's so. He's at the gate. In the same way as the disciples would confidently affirm the things that they taught though people would consider them to be mad. And then there was a man in Acts chapter 26 and verses 24 and 25, and this is what the Revised Version says. And as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art mad! Thy much learning doth turn thee to madness. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. So in this room is a group of crazy Marys <laughs> preaching the truth in their ecclesias to a world that thinks that we are mad. To an increasing quantity of atheists who are as zealous in their attempt to beat down faith as we are in preaching it. Extending it. Wonderful Mary. Mary of Magdala reminds us of those in the society in which we live. And those who are in our ecclesias that require us to extend ourselves beyond the limitations of what we are comfortable with and have grown up with. To see past all the clean and all the right and all the together of our lives to unclean, broken mess in other people's lives. The stink of fall apart, of family decay. To extend patience and love to the unlovable, to exercise and be the fingers on the hand of the God of the fallen. 
Mary might have been the bottom of the ecclesia, but she was the first one. She who was last, Christ made first by telling her first what had happened to him. These brothers and sisters, like Mary of Magdalene, they, they don't need our judgment. They don't need our harsh words. They don't need our superficial and idiotic solutions that we think we have to their complex problems. They need our prayers and our love. This woman was a watchtower. She wasn't very impactful because of her notoriety in the end. She was Mary of Magdala because she was up first and early. She was a watchtower looking to do the right thing. Looking for what God would bring her way. And she found the living Christ. And she took that message to the others. The first apostle of the resurrection was a woman. Mary of Magdala. Beautiful, crazy Mary. 